During the early 19th century, there were over five million Jews living in Eastern Europe, many in ghetto communities in cities and others in villages known as shtetls. Life for the majority was basic and difficult. Jews could only live in permitted areas and were restricted to particular professions. The occasions they could forget their troubles were during religious and secular celebrations in which klezmer music played a central part, as did the people who performed it, the musicians known as klezmorim. The klezmorim were freelance professional musicians available for weddings, funerals and bar mitzvahs. They had more freedom than was usual for Jews at the time, which gave them a certain reputation. They were kind of the bad boys of the, of the Jewish old world in that they didn't respect um, what they were told by the people in the synagogue. They were in the community, but also not in the community. They were, weren't like a proper Jew who has to follow all the traditions. When you gypsy life, you are a little bit different. You not follow all the rules. When you play, you have to be creative. When you're creative, you break the rules. We don't know a lot about the klezmorim. Secular music was not considered important enough to document. By all accounts, they were low down in the pecking order and it was by no means a lucrative profession. You wouldn't want your daughter to marry one, but no wedding was complete without them. Weddings, weddings were the most, uh, was the main um, place where classical musicians could play and earn some money. Weddings brought whole communities together for a good time, and for this, a band was fundamental. In fact, there is an old Yiddish saying, a pish una fals is via chasene una klezme. Literally, a piss without a fart is like a wedding without a band. Klezme accompanied every part of the ceremony. There were melodies to escort the families between homes, melodies to greet the guests, and melodies for seating the bride. The band would process through the streets, gathering the guests. That would be the first thing. They would play a, a type of tune that's in, we now play it in three, and it goes something like this. They'd have to string together a whole load of tunes in that same time signature, and then they would stop at each house, and then people would come out, and then they'd move on until they got to the moment where they're going to play for the bride. What's interesting about a Jewish wedding is that often the piece that one would play for the bride can be quite a tearjerker, not an upbeat sort of happy tune necessarily, you know, it's actually often about making everybody cry and feel like, you know, kind of moved. The Badkhan would sing, oh my beloved bride, now has come the time in your life when you must leave your home. You thought life was hard before, now it's going to be even harder, you'll have to raise children, the pain of which is too terrible for words, you'll be on your own, your husband will go out and pray all day and go to work and you'll be at home with the children. All this kind of terrible message about adulthood and you're leaving your mother who's looked after you and now you're, you're responsible for doing this yourself. And she'd cry. Weddings were usually outdoors, under a canopy, or chuppah, symbolizing the home the bride and groom were about to enter together. Sometimes the groom would also be tested on his resolve. They would explain to him that this was the day of no going back, this was the day of reckoning with God. Now you must, all your knowledge of Hebrew and your knowledge of the Bible must 
come together and you must be a proper man now that you're being married, you have responsibilities. It was quite austere and quite serious. He would cry too. With everyone thoroughly miserable, the ceremony would build to its climax. The bride and groom would sip from a cup of wine. The ring would be placed. And then, the moment everyone had been waiting for. When the groom says, I, I will remember the Jerusalem, and he breaks the glass. Drzz. This was the cue for the band to launch into a Freilax, a joyful tune. The majority of klezmer tunes are upbeat, and at weddings, guests have a duty to entertain the bride and groom by dancing. They have to dance, you have no choice. You have to stand up and dance, otherwise you're not Jew. <laughs> you have to be happy. It's mitzvah, it's a good, good thing to say, mitzvah, to do. It's mitzvah to dance and mitzvah to be happy at the wedding. It's rhythm's extraordinary. It's not there to make everybody go, yeah, that's groovy. It's there to make everybody get out their seat and sort of throw themselves around and eat matzahs. These infectious dance numbers were designed to release the emotions and keep people up on their feet for hours. It's about like feeling the beat on the one, you know, like feeling very grounded into the earth. And that's why, you know, klezmer is a real true dance genre because you feel like you want to just sort of bounce off the, the sort of first beat in the bar and, and, kind of, and kind of move with it. For the Jews of Eastern Europe, Klezmer acted as a kind of sonic glue, one of the things that bound them together as a people. There are songs that everybody knows at every wedding you've ever been to, and that somehow adds to the, the meaning of the occasion because you remember the last time that it was played, you remember all the times in your life that it was played and that you danced to it, and you remember the steps, and maybe you were holding hands with different people, but there's something about that repetition that's very powerful and that has that link back through the through the generations. The East European Klezmorim didn't just play for Jews, they performed for non-Jews too which required a completely different playlist. What we have to remember is that Klezmorum didn't just play kind of klezmer tunes. You know, it was a very fluid um, repertoire. And it was, there was a lot of borrowing that went on from other indigenous peoples who lived around and about. So whether that was the Turk Turkish community or the Poles, you know, plenty of polkas in the Jewish repertoire, plenty of Romanian tunes. In Poland, for example, Polonaise, Polka, in Russia, Kazachok. That the Klezmer players were from an outcast culture only made them more interesting. And sometimes they were asked to play something Jewish. Can you play for us something Jewish to laugh? <laughs> ah, it sounds so interesting, so <laughs> funny. It's not ours, you know, but they were asked to play. And when they asked to play, you have to pay. Even nowadays, if when you come to a Russian restaurant and if you request a song, you have to give some money. <laughs> I play in a Russian restaurant and this tradition, um, they don't understand. British people, when they, when they come to a Russian restaurant, they just request, request, request. But we, as a musicians, <laughs> we say, no, <laughs> no, 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 you have to put some money. <laughs> um, and this, is, this tradition actually develops the musician encourages the musician to know more, more songs. Yeah. 
the Klesmorim often played with another outcast group, the Gypsies. In fact, under Russian law, Jews and Gypsies were the only two groups permitted to be professional musicians outside an orchestra. And both sets of musicians were catalysts for change. Both Jewish musicians and Gypsy musicians in Eastern Europe took kind of popular music and did something else with it so that things that were kind of ballroom or even court, um, you know, as in royal court, waltzes and polkas and things like that became something else and developed into, you know, the bulgars and the freiliks and the horrors that you associate with klezmer music. So klezmer was a magpie music made up of many different elements. And there was yet one more influence that would add a spiritual note to the mix, and that came from the Hasidim. Mm -hmm. 